Joining us now on the line from Washington, D.C., Moises Naim. He is former editor of Foreign Policy Magazine, now senior associate at Carnegie's International Economics Program, where his research focuses on international economics and global politics. I want to start with this war on fill in the blanks, because that's what you've been writing a lot about lately. The war on poverty, the war on drugs, the war on terror. What makes declaring war on one of those social issues such an attractive metaphor for politicians everywhere? Wars are great to unify people, to mobilize energy, to get budgets without controls, to increase uh, uh, level of attention, and to minimize uh, criticism. When you are at war, any criticism against you is anti-patriotic, it's, uh, it's not acceptable, and so on. So the metaphor of war uh, is very attractive and very appealing, and typically yields to very bad policy. I understand that from the politician's point of view, but from the point of view of a citizen, uh, do we support these wars when they are declared? Very often we do. Remember uh, how much support, at least in the United States, the war on terror had, right? You know, the United States was attacked, and then uh, the reaction was to declare the war on terror, which uh, it's like declaring a war on a technique. Uh, uh, terror is not uh, an enemy. Terror is, is an instrument. And so we declared a war on an instrument. Um, a war. The, the other big metaphor, of course, is the Marshall Plan. Uh, everyone calls for a Marshall Plan, as you know, the initiative that, that helped Europe uh, uh, recover after the war, after the Second World War. So there, is a, there are Marshall Plans called for everything and anything, for the, uh, against uh, uh, drunk, uh, drunk driving and uh, uh, against uh, uh, trying to, to restore all sorts of countries, nations. Whenever there is a problem, we either declare war on that problem or we call for a Marshall Plan uh, to deal with that problem. Well, let me pick up on that Marshall Plan angle because you wrote about this earlier this year in Foreign Policy magazine when you wrote, the Marshall Plan metaphor has been irresistible with its implications of massive funding and unquestioning public support. But the original Marshall Plan, launched by the United States to help Europe after World War II, was neither as financially sizable nor as uncontroversial as proponents commonly assume. Why, in your view, is the appeal of this so-called you know, massive Marshall Plan to attack a particular problem not based in reality? It, well, the appeal is because the Marshall Plan was very successful, uh, at least in terms of uh, if you define the objective of the Marshall Plan as restoring growth uh, in Europe, rebuilding Europe uh, that was bombed uh, and destroyed, after, during the Second World War, well, here we have Europe that, that is resurgent, that is successful, that is modern, that is peaceful. So uh, what's not to like? The Marshall Plan is very, very attractive. And so we have called for Marshall Plans on Africa, we, in, on Latin America. Belgium has a, a very backward region, Wallonia. There was a, a call, an appeal to launch a Marshall Plan uh, to try to bring Wallonia uh, back to uh, the, the, the levels of Europe and so on. They don't work. None, none of these Marshall Plans after the original Marshall Plan ha, ha, has ever worked because the Marshall Plan had very specific conditions. The receiving countries had uh, very different conditions. Uh, trying to help out Europe uh, uh, was different. Uh, Europe has what experts call absorptive capacity. It had institutions, uh, it had uh, uh, human resources, human capital that were able to deal with this uh, uh, infusion of money and aid in ways that a lot of these tar new targets of the Marshall Plans don't have. So when we launch a Marshall Plan today to address some various ill around the world, are you telling us it almost invariably leads to bad policy nowadays? Yes, uh, it has happened so far. That doesn't mean that we cannot uh, get lucky and get uh, some success in some kind of Marshall Plan. Essentially, the po politicians use it for, uh, because it has the ring of money and the ring of unaccountability. Give me a lot of money. Let's throw a lot of money to this problem, and it, we, will be, we will solve it. Uh, and, and so the Marshall Plan has a very appealing brand. In the same way, as I said before, the brand that is, let's declare war on poverty, AIDS, uh, the drunk driving, uh, and so on. And, and again, it has the appeal of let's, go, let's unify, let's get together uh, to fight this external enemy. Let's put a lot of resources, let's stop the internal bickering, let's not have divisions, let's not have criticism. Let's just go ahead together as a nation against this external enemy. 
That's well, very attractive. Sure. Let's take a look at one of those wars, the war on drugs. How do you think that's going so far? <laughs> uh, it's very interesting. 76% of Americans uh, think that, uh, when asking surveys, they think that the war on drugs is not working. However, when you ask them if the, it needs to be changed, they say no. So there is this contradiction between knowing that something is not working, but not, not wanting to, 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 to touch it. No one, you know, being reluctant to any change. And uh, we know that the war on drugs uh, is not working. We know that it's uh, uh, billions, about $40 billion a year, uh, and it has been going on for 40 years, and there is absolutely no evidence that drug consumption has declined, uh, that crime is going down, or that the policy is working. Yet, there is deep reluctance to touch it, to, uh, and any politician that uh, starts saying that the, drug on, uh, the war on drugs doesn't work is immediately attacked for being soft on crime, for being in, pro, in favor of the drug kingpins, of being... Uh, and again, we have fallen into this uh, dual metaphor in which you either have complete prohibition or you have complete legalization. And so uh, it, it's impossible to have a rational uh, conversation to find things that work better or at least test alternative ways to what we have now and have had for 40 years that doesn't work. But again, the war on drugs continues to be a very appealing metaphor for politicians. Do you think there actually is a middle ground where, you know, if we were able to have an adult conversation about this, we could find some common cause? Absolutely. What I think and what I think is evident and indisputable is that what we have is, does not work. So if you start with that premise, let's at least allow ourselves to find other options. No one is saying that other options are going to be costless or they will not have consequences that are bad for society or that uh, are easy to implement. But they may have less of those bad consequences than what we have now and may it work out better. But again, the option is not prohibition or legalization. We need to find a middle ground that, and test and see how it works and perhaps change it. But we cannot continue to be stuck in this uh, dichotomy that is taking us nowhere. Let's talk about another one of those wars. This one's the war on terror. And again, I'm going to quote from your piece in Foreign Policy earlier this year to bring our viewers uh, up to scratch on where you are on this. Recognizing that language is power, U.S. President Barack Obama took a key first step in banning the bad metaphor. At his insistence, the Pentagon was forced to lose its precious GWAT, Global War on Terror acronym, and the GWAT mentality that went with it. But as many of his predecessors learned, Obama is finding that wars are hard to exit. Once a war against poverty, crime, or terrorism is launched, announcing a unilateral truce is usually political suicide. Instead, presidents get boxed into absolutist policies in which compromise is impossible and victory is the only acceptable outcome. Can you follow up on that a little bit? Why is it so difficult to get, and, and Afghanistan and Iraq, they're both great examples of once you get into a war, how absolutely difficult it seems to get be, one seems to be able to get out of it. And, and, that, and that's the, the, the essence of the story is the definition of victory. What is the definition of victory of the war in Afghanistan? Remember, originally the mission and victory was defined to go into Afghanistan and uh, uh, take out Al-Qaeda and stop Afghanistan from be being uh, um, the, the headquarters from which attacks against the United States and other countries were planned, launched, and there was training and all a whole, an entire infrastructure in support of that. So that was achieved, but then there was a resurgence. Uh, of the Taliban and others uh, uh, in, in, in uh, Afghanistan. And so the mission then, it became more uh, related to nation building. It was trying to, be, to bring human rights to, to the country, trying to build institutions, trying to have a democracy there, uh, elections, trying to protect the rights of women, uh, and all, all, uh, a whole slew of very, very ambitious, complex nation building type uh, of, of missions. So the definition of victory changed. Before it was stopping Afghanistan from being a base for Al-Qaeda, then it became creating a new state that was more 
capable of fending, defending its borders and, and, and creating a more democratic society. And now that is again, um, then it became including uh, Pakistan. And so it was no longer, the definition was no longer Afghanistan. It was what in Washington is called AFPAC, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, looking at both uh, as, a, as, a, as a totality, which is, I think, the correct way of thinking about it, and including the fact that Pakistan has atomic weapons and, and, and nuclear, nuclear capabilities and so on. And then now um, things are not going well, and the definition of uh, that war and that victory has changed. So remember, when you declare war, you need to have a definition of what victory is. And again, declaring war boxes you into that kind of conversation that then makes it politically radioactive to leave uh, or change the, 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 your mission uh, without uh, uh, running the risk that your opposition is going to say that you lost the, the war, uh, quote unquote. Okay, let's do in our last few minutes here one more war, and this one's going to be the war on drugs. And this time I'm going to quote from Politico. Here's Glenn Gr uh, Greenwald. Ten years ago, Portugal became the first Western nation to pass full-scale, nationwide decriminalization. That law passed October 1st, 2000, abolished criminal sanctions for all narcotics, not just marijuana, but also hard drugs like heroin and cocaine. By any metric, Portugal's drug decriminalization scheme has been a resounding success. Drug usage in many categories has decreased in absolute terms, including for key demographic groups like 15 to 19-year-olds. Where usage rates have increased, the increases have been modest, far less than in most other European Union nations, which continue to use a criminalization approach. How is it that somehow in Portugal they managed to figure out a way around all of those difficulties you talked about earlier, the, the looking soft on drugs, but they haven't been able to figure that out in the United States yet? The United States, as you know, has a, is a bigger country with a um, wider uh, diversity of cultures. Uh, it is a more heterogeneous country. And I, I, think, I think at this point, uh, the need is to create a safer space uh, for politicians to be able to dare to talk about alternatives to what we now have. How do we create Again, that safer repeat, space? By creating, these are, this has more to do with conversations at dinner tables and at schools and universities and in the media than in the corridors of power. You cannot ask politicians to commit suicide and go out and say, I don't believe in prohibition. Let's uh, think again uh, and, and find different approaches to uh, uh, the consumption and distribution of narcotics. Because that's political suicide and, and professional suicide. You cannot ask for people to be uh, suicidal in what they do. So it is uh, uh, the voters, it is public opinion, it is journalists, it is professors, students, uh, and, and families uh, discussing what are the consequences of all this and aren't there better ways of dealing with the tragic consequences of drug consumption. This is not about allowing and being, it's not a hippie-like uh, uh, kind of atmosphere. It's trying to be m more humane, uh, more effective, more intelligent in uh, dealing with a scourge that is terrible. But at this point, all we have is incarceration, repression, interdiction, and prohibition. And we know that these things have not worked. In which case, in our last 30 seconds here, if we don't like the expression war on drugs, poverty, terror, whatever, let's give our politicians um, a different literary analogy to use. What would you suggest that they could use that would be preferable? It will depend. It's issue specific. But uh, having rational policy is not a bad idea. <laughs> rational policy is not a bad idea. And we live in the times which allow for that, don't we? Mm, not, not quite. Well, no, not quite, but uh, that doesn't mean we need to give up. If we uh, go for the soundbite, if we go for uh, the emotional uh, only uh, kind of uh, moniker, and we stay away from rational conversations, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a very bad thing. I think we deserve better, we can do better, and we can have more intelligent conversations about social problems that are thorny and that don't have one-liners and bumper stickers as solutions. Hmm. Moises Naim, it's a great pleasure to meet you, and thanks so much for coming on TVO tonight. Appreciate your time. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me.